Hi everyone, it's day 61 of the Vendée Globe and today I'm joined by two young fans of the race that have both been following at their schools. Now in France, the Vendée Globe education programme is huge with schools across the country following the race. The sailors, they follow the weather, the geography and the adventures that these skippers are sharing through their social media. Um, yesterday in the race, British sailor Pip Hare had to replace her rudder at sea an incredible feat, which I know a little bit about, as it also happened to me during my own Bondi Globe. Now let's bring in my guests. It's Molly Sale and Izzy Humphreys. <laughs> hey girls, how you doing? Good. good. Good, good, good. Now, I know that you've been following the race with, <laughs> uh, with some interest and you've got some questions. Uh, before we get into the questions, who's winning at the moment? Um... Yannick. Yannick Bestevin, that's right. And one more question from me. Who's your favourite sailor? Daddy. Um, <laughs> I don't know, because my favourite sailor's not in the race anymore. Uh, was that Alex Thompson or Sam Davis? Yeah, both of them. Both I think I quite like Pip Hare. She's doing really well as well. She's doing really well. Right, do you want to fire away with your questions? I think uh, if, if Molly, you start... Uh, and okay, then we'll take sure. turns. So my first question is, who do you think could win the Vendée Globe this year? That is uh, a really difficult one to answer because um, I think Yannick Bestevin, who's leading at the moment, he's got about a four or five hundred mile lead, but it's the weather's really complicated and there's maybe five or six boats that could win. My favourite person to win, I think, would be Jean Lacan because this is his fifth race and uh, he's been on the podium once before, but uh, at the age of 61, he's doing an incredible job. Do you think the Vendée Globe is one of the most difficult races? And if so, why? Yeah, I think it is the most difficult race uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, number one, you've got to be very physically fit because the boats are very difficult to sail. Uh, you've got to be very mentally tough because it's a long race and you go through a lot of different challenges. And you've got to be multi-skilled. You've got to be able to fix the boat. You've got to navigate. You've got to be able to sail the boat fast. Uh, but you've also got to be a media star. You've got to cook. You've got to look after yourself, uh, medical in injuries and so on. So, you know, it really has everything. Which would be your dream boat out of all of the boats on the race this year? Wow, uh, I think I really liked Alex Thompson's boat, um, but mm -hmm. he had a, a, an accident. I liked the way that they thought about the interior, um, and I think that would have been really exceptional. Um, the other boat I really liked actually was Coram, uh, but that boat dismastered, so both my favourites uh, went out in the early part of the race. Uh, I have to say that during this race, the, uh, the older generation boats have done really well and of course they've been very reliable which is uh, a great thing which is why we've got so many boats still in the race. Why do you think that in this year's race there has been so many people that have had to pull out? Well I think the, the main incidents have been a few boats have had collisions, one boat's lost its mast uh, but in general this race has been one of the best races for, um, for accidents with boats. Normally Sometimes less than 50% of the starters who, who start this race will finish. And this time round, at the moment, touch wood, we've only got six boats that have, uh, that have left the race, um, which we could, could see a record number of finishes, which is fantastic. Do you think that anyone who has had to pull out of this race could have won if they hadn't have had to pull out? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Coram and uh, and certainly Jeremy Bayou, although he restarted, I think they were both um, would have been well up there favourites. Um, it's hard to really, really know because, uh, you know, one of the things about this race is finishing it is the, the, the toughest thing. It's the really most difficult thing. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, of the boats still in the race, you know, my eye is still firmly on uh, on Yannick. I think he's just sailing such a good tactical race that uh, he he's going to be hard to beat. 
Who do you think has had the worst luck? Who's had the worst luck? Well, you'd have to say Jeremy Bayou uh, was uh, was pretty unlucky. Um, Sam Davis was really unlucky. She she hit uh, something in the water and, and broke her, her boat and, and, and had to have some outside help. But at least she's still carrying on. But um, I don't know, what do you think? I think Kevin from PRB had the worst luck. Well, yeah, you, I would agree as well. Kevin uh, broke his boat and... Um, he doesn't get much, uh, you know, less lucky than that, I suppose. Do you think that anyone who, like, doesn't have foils or any of the new technical things on some of the higher quality boats could or could still win? Wow, what a question. Um, I think there's a good chance that a non-foiler could still win, but... Um, what it needs is for the, the the South Atlantic to be very tricky and non non traditional and not too much reaching or or, or upwind sailing. Um, it, it's going to be hard because at the moment the first three boats are all foilers, uh, and two of those boats have still yet to really show their full potential. Uh, and I think we will see their full potential in the coming days as they start to get back into the North Atlantic and, and reach back up. Um, so uh, I, I think my money would be on a foiler winning the race, but, mm. uh, but my dream would be to see Jean Le Cam there. Do you think your rider did a good job in 2004 to 2005 Vendée Globe? What a question. Well, it's interesting we're talking about rudders. Um, I've got a little video here of, uh, of the, the, the rudder incident in 2004-05. And of course, Pip Hare um, has just broken a rudder and managed to replace her rudder at sea in the Southern Ocean, which is no mean feat, inc incredibly difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, I replaced my rudder when I was in Cape Town in, in, in sheltered waters. But let's have a quick look at that uh, that video. Hang on a second, let's bring it up now. Meanwhile, Humphreys is powering through the Southern Atlantic with pace until on day 28, he hits a submerged object and he hits it at speed. Conrad is flung across the cabin, survives the impact, but one of the boat's two rudders is snapped. I don't really know what to say. I'm gonna make it to Cape Town. Got an emergency rudder. Um, I might be able to fit it. If, if I can't, we'll just have to see what happens. Has his dream to race around the world alone in the Vendée Globe been blown apart? He heads for Cape Town, his race hanging in the balance. The South African coast ahead. He looks for a safe and sheltered mooring, somewhere to inspect the damage. He finds a beautiful sheltered bay off Simonstown. But make a mistake picking up a mooring, and he'd be forced to turn on his engine, and that would mean disqualification from the race. First task completed. But the big job lay ahead. He's about to attempt a first, to replace a rudder alone at sea. Normally a crane and a four-person shore team would do this, but for Conrad, a snorkel, ingenuity, determination and self-belief would have to do. All the time though, his rivals are steaming away. With limited oxygen, he plans his mission carefully. Just what will he discover under the hull? The water is warm, good for Conrad, good for tourists too, many of whom come here to see sharks. But no unwelcome visitors, no more surprises for Conrad. The damage was not worse than he thought, but he's not even started the job. The jagged edge of the broken rudder. The whole rudder must be removed. It's a difficult shape, heavy, around 80 kilos, similar to that of Conrad, and it floats. 
time for some ingenuity. Conrad prepares his solution. He attaches the rudder to the anchor chain and gives gravity a helping hand. That's the theory. Fail here though, and it's game and race over. Back on board again, exhausted but fueled by adrenaline, he tries to force the old runner off. And succeeds. Huge relief, but still, it's only the beginning. He winches the old rudder back on board. Now, totally exhausted, he's been at his mooring for 36 hours. Conrad does not have the clock on his side. He has just eight minutes of emergency air. He uses up vital minutes, preparing the way for the new rudder. He creates a pulley system. Once in place, getting the rudder into position will be a grind. He gently slides the new rudder the water. Has he created an extraordinary solution to a seemingly impossible problem? Or not? From above, he tries to pull the rudder into position. His pained expression goes. An incredible solo accomplishment back into the water. Release the lines. One final check. And then, for Conrad, quite a feeling. <laughs> Conrad Humphreys, back in the Vendée Globe. Now, Molly. You sent me this fantastic picture of your uh, your designed Open 60. Can you describe some of your features on the boat? Sure. So um, we have a very wonky foil and a very wonky rudder because I'm not very good at drawing them. <laughs> but we, I have the keel, which is the pink thing at the bottom, and the bow stick at the front, and uh, my big sail. And your big sail, your very colourful mm -hmm. big sail. Now you've also got Sam's boat there as well. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you like about Sam's Sam's actual boat? Well, I like it because it's like really vibrant and red. And I think the charity which supports her is really good because it's a heart charity. That's right. It's it is. Now, should we have a quick look at the uh, the tracker and the weather forecast? Sure. Uh, um, this was the situation just a, 24 hours ago. Um, if we zoom in a little bit, you can just uh, see what's going on. And we'll just run the tracker through. Now, a couple of days ago, Yannick had a, a good lead. He was uh, about 200, 250 miles ahead of the next boat. And over the last couple of days, He's really extended that lead. Right now, he's 400 miles ahead of the PVA uh, with Thomas Rue on, on linked out. But if we look at the weather forecast, Yannick is about to slow down because the weather's going to get very tricky and very light ahead. So this is the current situation with the weather forecast. Um, and you can see we've got Yannick up here. 
Uh, and then we've got Apivia, Charlie and Thomas back down here. Now you can see there's some light winds ahead of Yannick. And if we look at what happens in the forecast, so that this is at lunchtime today. If we look at lunchtime tomorrow, you see what happened there. The weather has got all the blue space around Yannick. That's very light winds. Whereas the boats behind, they've got this low pressure system, this weather system, which is giving them some stronger winds. And then if we look into Sunday, you can see that they've really closed up and uh, it looks like uh, Charlie Dallin has almost caught up with Yannick by, uh, by Sunday. Uh, I don't know if we can go as far as Monday. But yeah, by Monday, he's, he looks like he's, he's caught him up. So it's going to be really difficult for Yannick over the weekend. Now, I've got a question for both of you about the weather. It's a difficult question to answer. But how do you think the world makes weather happen? Do you know, do you know how, how we get rain and, and wind and clouds? Any ideas? Um, well, the rain evaporate, evaporates from the sea and the mountains. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we get uh, we get water evaporating off the uh, heated up and and it rises and then when it rises into the sky, it cools down. What does it form when it cools down? Rain. It forms some rain and some clouds. So I was going to tell you a little bit about how global weather happens now what have we got at either end of the earth at the very top of the earth and the very bottom of the earth antarctica that's right we've got antarctica and, and the arctic and they're very cold aren't they very cold yeah. areas and then what have we got going around the equator do we know what that's called nope okay so we've got around the equator we've got the, the tropics we've got lots of sunshine it's very hot and what happens at the equator is the air rises at the equator and then it it drifts out around to the poles and sinks at the poles and that creates these great big circles wind rising at the equator and sinking at the poles and then what does the earth do it spins on it on its axis and as it spins round it creates this, this circulation and we have something called the Coriolis force which produces our, our wind gyres. Uh, that's on a, on a much bigger scale, on a macro scale and then we also have these high and these low pressure systems um, on a smaller scale. So yeah, weather is really important. It, it, it keeps all of us, our health and our well-being because in, in the UK at the moment, we have quite cold weather, but in the summer we have warmer weather, which means we can grow crops and we can produce food uh, without having to import food. So weather is really, really important. Right, let's go back. Now, have you guys got any more questions before we wrap up? Yeah, I've got three. Okay, let's go for those. So my first one is, as you know, you've done the one day globe. So what rule would you change? Wow. What rule will I change? Well, I'll tell you the rule I would change. So around on the race track, you will have seen this long line called the ice limit line, and it prevents the boats from, from going into the ice line. Now, I'm not a big fan of it. The reason it's there is to keep people safe out of the ice. And of course, that's really important but also it restricts their, their sailing course. And sometimes it can be quite a dangerous line because it creates this sort of artificial coast. Um, and I'd like to see, you know, maybe us to go back to the, the sort of ice gates or, or waypoints. Um, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. But that's one rule I'd probably like to try and change. So my other question is, if you know Pip Hare, she's lost her rudder. Do you think she'll have to replace her rudder the same way as you did? So she has replaced her rudder. Uh, she did it this morning and she used a very, very similar system. So she used the anchor chain, uh, but they put it into a bucket or into a, a, a container. And then she didn't go to a, to, to a, a, 
a land place or, 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 or any shelter. She did it, slowed the boat right down. Um, she put out a, a parachute or a drogue behind the boat to really slow the boat down, took the sails down. And then she suspended this, this anchor chain under the rudder to help her pull the rudder out uh, and then uh, float the new rudder back in again in the same way. But very, very difficult to do that when you're in the Southern Ocean because you know, the, the water's not static. It's always moving around. There's always some waves. And of course, that makes it really, really difficult. So she did brilliantly. And I have one last question. As you said in that video, the water was nice and warm. Do you think the water would have been as warm when she did it? Well, uh, let's. if she was in the Southern Ocean, which we know she was, the water would have been maybe one or two degrees uh, where she is, so extremely cold. Um, I would have expect that she would have done it without getting in the water, um, whereas my mm -hmm. situation was quite different. I didn't really have a, have a very good plan. I had to sort of make up the plan. Uh, and of course, where I was in the water, the water was, was quite a lot warmer because I was in Cape Town, where um, the water temperature was much, much warmer, which is why there's so many big fish in that bay and, uh, and lots of great white sharks and uh, lots of penguins and, and, um, and, and lots of seals and, and various things to see. So really, really good questions. Thank you so much. Uh, both of you. I hope you'll come back and join me on the show again. Uh, if, yeah. um, we can do that. So that was Molly Searle and Izzy Humphreys joining me today for the these fantastic questions. Really, really great, great questions. Uh, on Monday, we're back with a new guest. So tune in then. Uh, but otherwise, have a great weekend and keep watching. We'll see you soon. Bye bye.